Hello and welcome to Homer Cotline. I'm Craig Gross. And I'm Wilfred Smith. And it doesn't seem possible, but yet another year has passed by here on Homer Cotline. Now that's right, Craig. Today marks the 11th anniversary of Homer Cotline. And on today's show, we'll celebrate uh, by saluting the past 11 years with some video of Homer Cotline, the early years, better known as the bloopers. But before we begin let's, uh, today's anniversary uh, edition of the show, a special treat. Each year our, on our anniversary, we begin the program with a classic opening title tape. And today we're proud to share one from 1985, 10 years ago. So John, roll that tape and let's begin our 11th anniversary show. Welcome to Homework Hotline, I'm Craig Gross. Homework Hotline, of course, is your show, and we're here to answer your homework questions in mathematics, English, science, social studies, you name it, we're here to help. Now, today on the program, I'm going to be covering linear equations. Okay, and let's see what our, my friend Wilfred Smith is up to today. Today, Craig, uh, I'll be graphing um, some functions, and also, time permitting, trying to find the measure of an angle formed by the hands of a clock. And we're going to get started in just about a minute. But first, here's one of my teaching partners, Deborah Gaines Matthews, to fill us in on our live calls. Deborah. Thank you, Wilfred. Indeed, I am Deborah Gaines Matthews. And just listen to these phones. Your calls are very important to us, and we're here to help you. As you can hear, the phones are very busy right now. So if you're having trouble getting through, please be patient. And even though today is our anniversary special, we're still taking your calls. And if you have an English question, call. Ask for me. Maybe we can do your question live on the air today. English comes on today a little after 5 o'clock, so stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Wilfred and Craig. Thank you, Deborah. As we said at the top of the show, today is our 11th anniversary celebration. And as a part of that celebration, we have assembled some tapes of our favorite moments on this show. Now, speaking on behalf of all the math teachers, my favorite part of the show has to be the witty and alliterative introductions we routinely receive from the Bard of Hollywood, Marius Suarez. And we've put together a short reel of those introductions that we love to call the quip reels. But now, let's get back to those two peerless purveyors of hypotheses and proofs, Wilfred and Frank. Thank you, Mario. So stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Doris and Wilfred, our paired paragons of polygons and proofs. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mario. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with the twin nabobs of numeracy, Frank and Wilford. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Doris and Robert, those twin masters of decimal deafness. Well, thank you, the Bard of Hollywood. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Robert and Doris, your hotline refuge from the slings and arrows of outrageous mathematical ill fortune. Ah. 
That was very nice. Let me remind you that these are the unmatched master mavens of mathematical matter and material on good. <laughs> We're speechless. I don't know what to say. That but stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Irene and Wilford, those dual devotees of the divisible, the dividends and divisors, and the distributive. Wow, those are a lot of Ds there. But stay tuned now for 40 minutes of math with Robert and Wilford, legionnaires of logic, staunch defenders of the mathematical verities in the Fort Zinderhofs of the arithmetic Saharan waste. Okay, all right, and we will find an oasis in that desert. Now. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Robert and Wilford, sure-footed trusty guides, ready to lead you safely through the murky mathematical morass of uncertainty and the unknown. Touche. I parried, I thrusted, and I lost. Now back to homework hotlines, dynamite, two-fisted contenders in all the mathematical divisions, battling Humphrey and Kid Vriesman, taking on bad news algebra and tricky Cal Culus. All right. Now, <laughs> all right. Now stay tuned for round one. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, Doris Johnson Humphreys. <laughs> Thank you. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of homework hotline with Ellen and Wilfred, those paradigms, ni plus ultra. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Wilfred and Robert, that brace of peerless Euclid elucidators. You, I, Euclid elucidators. I guess you could say that. But stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Doris and Robert, the yin and yang of geometry and algebra. <laughs> Yalgebra. Remember, I can't go on. You but stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Irene and Wilford, homework hotline's own Fred and Ginger, dancing their decimal ways into your living room. Uh, thank you, Mr. Suarez. I guess I'm ginger now. Remember, you can call in your questions simply by calling 1-800-527-8839 or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. The call is free, the help is free. So what are you waiting for? And now will you dance along, Fred? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Ginger. My first question, and we're back live. And remember, you can get your homework questions answered simply by calling 1-800-527-8839 or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. The call is free. The help is free. So what are you waiting for? And now to begin, here's Craig. Thank you so much, Wilfred. And how do you follow an act like that? OK, I understand I have a caller on the line. Is the caller there? Yeah. Yes, and what is your name, ma'am? Natalie. Natalie, would you like to help me out with a couple of problems, please? Yeah. All right, then, Natalie, what I have here is some linear problems. What we're going to do is just try to solve for the, um, for the unknown variables. Okay. okay? All right, then. Uh, Natalie, can you see this problem? Yeah. Could you read it out for the least tens of people that are watching right now? Um, N over 9 plus 5 equals 13. Equals 13. Okay, in this type of problem, what we're trying to do is solve for this n, okay? Okay. Now, in this type of problem, what I like to do is I like to get my, uh, my unknown variables out of these fractions. Mm -hmm. And what can you think of would be a good way to get, uh, get rid of this fraction? How could I get rid of this fraction right here? Um, multiply 9 okay. by 5. Okay, or multiply everything. By, by nine. By nine. There you go. Okay, that's what I'll do. I'll take the entire, entire equation and then multiply it by nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. First case, the nine times the nine here, these cancel out, right? That's yeah. going to give me what? Um, forty-five. And this one right oh, here. It will get n. N. Plus forty-five. And this would be nine times five would be forty-five. And then the last one will be equal like to. One hundred and seventeen. One hundred and seventeen. I oh. think. Let me just make sure. I'm gonna, you know, knowing me and my math skills. Here we go. We got 27. Yep, 117. Hey, you're better than I am. Way to go. I'm using a calculator. Oh, okay. Well, that's perfectly that's perfectly acceptable. That's fine. 
There we go. I'm just saying that to everybody out there. Oh, I'm not using a calculator? Oh, well, I guess I'm scum. No, that's wrong. <laughs> okay, we're doing fine. Now, we got n plus 45 equals 117. What's the next thing we're going to do with this subtract problem? Subtract 45 from both sides. I'm going to subtract 45 from both sides, okay? I am subtract this side. These eliminate each other. That gives me n. And then 40... 72. Okay, 17. 7 minus 5 is... 72. Two, so it's going to be 72, okay, and 11 minus 4 is 72. So n is going to be equal to 72. 72. Now, some people might just say, you know, I'm finished now, but in reality, we're not. We have to do something before we move on. What's the next thing we're going to have to do, Natalie? I have no idea. You have no idea? I can say, yeah, I've got the answer, but you've got to prove it, right? How, do we, how are we going to prove it? I don't know. Well, we can always check the answer, could we? Put the 72 back where the n is. Ah, exactly. We're going to check our answer by plugging this value back into the original equation. Okay. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Of course we are. Let's work on this work that way. Here we go. Original thing, we got parentheses over 9 plus 5 equals 13. equals 13, right? Okay, so I plug in my 72 here. Okay, let's see what we got. 72 divided by 9 gives me? 8. 8. Okay, I bring down, that's 8 plus 5 equals 13. Does 8 plus 5 equal 13? Yeah. Yes, it does. So 13 equals 13. So far, Natalie, you're doing wonderfully well. Thank you. Are you ready for, oh, yes, you're quite welcome. Are you ready for the next challenge? Okay. Okay, let's step over to this section of the board, shall we? Can you see this problem right here before? Uh-huh. Could you read that one out for everybody? A over 6 minus 15 equals 15. A over 6 minus 15 equals 15. That's very well read. Thank you so much. Now, in our particular problem here, Natalie, yeah. what did we do first of all? Uh, multiply 6 to the whole thing. Okay, because what we're trying to do? Um, we're trying to leave the A alone. You leave the A alone, get rid of that fraction, right? Yeah. Okay, so here we do. We're going to multiply the whole enchilada by 6. Uh, a minus 90. Okay, here we go. So that's going to be A. Minus 90. Okay, because these are limited. Minus 90. Equals 90. Equals 90, right? Yeah. Okay, so what am I doing next? Add 90 to both sides. Okay, I'll add 90 to both sides. I do this, I do this. 180. 80, and these eliminate, and this is going to be plus 90. That's going to be 180. 180. Are we finished? No. No, we're not. What do we have to do now? You have to put the 180 back up for the A was. Into the original problem, right? Yeah. Okay, let's do that right now, shall we? So we got, hey, we got some parentheses over 6 minus 15 equals 15. Uh-huh. All right, so we plug in the 180. Yeah, divided by 6. D divided by 6. six 30. Goes, so, okay, 30 minus 15. Equals 15. Equals 15. Okay, does 30 minus 15 equal 15? Yep. Yes, it does. 15 equals 15. 15. All right, then. So far, you've been up to the challenge. Let's try something a little bit trickier. Are you ready for that one? Oh, uh, okay. Okay, fine. Let's see what we got. Can you see this problem? No. Okay, now I can. Okay, now you can. All right, then. What does it say, please? Uh, X subtracted by 7 mm -hmm. over 8 equals negative 3. Negative 3. Okay, and this problem, what did we do in the original, the first two problems? We left the x alone. We, we multiplied trying... the, um, the whole thing by 8. Yeah, we multiplied the whole thing by 8. Well, in this particular case, we can't leave the x alone because the x is connected to this, x, uh, to this minus 7. We can't separate the two, okay? Uh-huh. So, therefore, we can still do what we've done before. Multiply the... 8 by 3. Okay, no, we can still do what we've done here oh, okay. in the original problem. But the thing is, it's going to be x minus 7 instead of just being x by itself. Uh -huh. All right? Okay. So, I'm going to multiply this whole thing by what? By 8. By 8, okay. Whole thing by 8. So this thing cancels out, that cancels out, and then that's times this. So that's 24. x minus 7 equals, equals 24. 20, 24. Huh? Negative 24. Negative 24. Thank you. You can just go right ahead. You're doing fine. What's the next thing we do? Um, add 7 to both sides. I add 7 to both sides, I add 7 to this side, these eliminate each other, I add 31. 7 to this side, it's going to be oh. negative 24 plus a positive 7. Uh, you subtract by 7. Okay, subtract. 17. 17, is it going to be positive or negative? 
Um, negative 17. It would be a negative 17 because we got a negative number on top, right? So it's a negative 17. Are we finished? No. Nope. What do we do now? We have to put it back. We have to put it back into where? Um, where the X is. Okay, where the X is, into the original? Problem. Into the original problem. Let's do that, shall we? Yeah. Okay, so now I've got negative 17 minus 7. Over 8. All over 8. Equals negative 3. Equals negative 3. All right, then. Let's see if this thing works out here. Negative 17 minus 7, or plus a negative, negative 7. Is 10. Okay. Negative what? 10. No, actually, they add them up, because that's a negative thing here, and that's another negative thing. So both coming together, what's that going to give me? Um, negative 17 plus another. Negative 10. I got no. a negative 17 plus a negative 17, plus a negative 7. If these are positive. 27? If, if these are positive, if that was a positive 17 and that was a positive 7, what would that add up to? Oh, uh, 70 plus 7? Let's say 17 plus 7. What would that 24. add up to? 24, exactly. So, but these are negatives, right? So instead of it being a positive 24, it's going to be? Negative 24. A negative 24, exactly. So I got negative 24 over 8. Is that equal to 3? If I divide negative 24 by 8... You're going to get negative 3. Am I going to get negative 3? Yeah. Yes, I am. Negative 3 equals negative three. Yeah. Natalie, yes. you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. You should be commended. In fact, you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh-huh. You enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, and I'll see you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's pretty much all of my time, but stay tuned for 10 more minutes of math with my good friend Wilfred. Take care now. Thank you very much, Mr. Gross. And to begin, we do have a caller on the line. Hello. Hello. And what is your name, please? Uh, Holman. Holman, what grade are you in? 12. And which school do you attend? Kennedy High School. All right. Now, Holman, this is our anniversary show. Yeah. Another year has passed. Uh-huh. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. Yes. And um, you're in the 12th grade, right? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Um, now, uh, we're going to graph uh, some um, function. Is that correct? That's right. All right. Now, I want you to take a look at the board, okay? Okay. All right. Can you see the problem? Yeah. All right. Would you read that for us, please, then, Holman? Yes. Um, it says y equals 1 minus the absolute value of 6 minus x. All right. And we want to graph that um, function, right? Right. Okay. Now, um, as you look at this, Holman, what do you observe first? Um, I look at the... Absolute, inside the absolute value. Right, so we see the absolute value, okay. And uh, from function identities, I believe that's what it is. You know that the app, what the graph of absolute value of x is equal to. Okay, so the absolute value of x, you know, you know the, you know how to graph that. That is, you know, you know this function. That is. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's look at this function first, and then see what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, describe what it looks like to us, um, then, Holman. It's, um, it's like a V-shaped in the first and second quadrant. Right, it's in the first and second quadrant. So um, I have a set of axes here, right? My Y and X axis, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, each of these represent one unit, okay? And you're saying that that graph is a V-shape because um, it starts out at uh, the origin, right? Correct. And, of course, it, it goes through 1, 1, and 1, 2, and so on, just like that, right? Right. So um, if we were to draw a dotted line, since that's not the real function that we're trying to plot, we just um, look at this, OK? Yeah. And of course, um, there's a similar thing going on in the, other di in the other quadrant. That's the second quadrant. And so the function, um, this is the graph of y equals the absolute value of x, right? Right. So this would be y equals the absolute value of x. OK, so that is good. And this looks like that too, doesn't it? Correct. All right, so this, the, this function should have some shape like this V. OK, continue. OK, um, in the original problem? Yes. Um, it said uh, 6 minus x. Right. I can't see the board, but um, okay. 6 minus, yeah, there you go. So we could rewrite that if we felt like it as the absolute value of what? The opposite of what? X. Well, you, you take out a negative, so it becomes x minus 6. Right. Can you see it now? Yeah. All right. So 
you're saying that this is the same as that. Correct. Okay, and that is true. But now, Homan, what is the absolute value of negative x? Oh, the absolute value of anything is always going to be positive. Right. So, so the, it's just, you can just cancel out the negative and get the absolute value of x minus 6. Okay, so this is the same as 1 minus the absolute value of x minus 6. Correct. So whether you say 6 minus x or x minus 6, it's the same thing, right? Correct. Okay, so that's good. All right. Now, what does that have to do with y equals the absolute value of x. Let's forget about the 1 for a moment, okay? Okay. Let's concentrate and even forget about the minus sign. Mm -hmm. What do we know about the relationship between the absolute value of x minus 6 and the absolute value of x? Well, x minus 6 would be 6 units to the right. Yes, yeah, so if we simply shift it over, 6 units to the right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and if we were to draw that same... Um, that same graph again, it's translated six units to the right. So this is what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Looks something like this. And this angle is about 45 degrees, right? Right. Okay, so this is the graph of um, y equals absolute value of x minus six, whereas this was y equals absolute value of x, right? That's okay. That looks like it's five units, isn't it? Excuse me? Is, it, is that five units or six? Is that one, two, three, four? Oh, that is only five. You are absolutely correct. Absolutely not the absolute value of x minus six. We need one more, and that's this, right? Yeah. Okay. You can see much clearer than I can. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. We're right here. Yeah. Good. Okay. And let's do it again. Oh, that was very good. Okay. And of course, um, so, hmm, there it is. All right. There it is. All, All right. right. So, we have just shown the absolute value of x minus 6. Can you still see? Yeah. All right. Now, what about this minus sign? Okay, well, you, you always, every time there's a minus sign, that means it's going to be symmetrical about the x-axis. Okay. So, what you're saying, if you know the graph of f of x, Okay? Mm -hmm. Then the graph of the opposite of f of x will be the same graph uh, about the x-axis on the other side, right? Right. So we're just going to flip this and turn it to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me draw that then, if I will. And so if I were to do this, right? Right. So now this would be the graph of y equals the opposite of the absolute value of x minus 6. Mm -hmm. True? Yeah. All right. Now it's, it's getting to be confusing to a lot of people, so let's review quickly, okay? This was the graph of y equals the absolute value of x. Everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. And now we translated, we moved 6 units to the right, and that gave us the graph of y equals the absolute value of x minus 6. Mm -hmm. And as we flipped it, now we have the graph of y equals the opposite of the absolute value of x minus 6, okay? Right. And um, so that it's not so confusing, I'm going to just erase these, okay? All right. And we're right there. Right. Now, we, didn't, we wanted to graph instead y equals 1 minus one minus the absolute value of x minus 6. So let's account for the 1 now, okay? Well, the 1 means um, that you have to move the whole graph, the graph of the angle, to one unit up. Up. So this is a positive 1, right? Right. And a lot of people make that mistake because they see this minus sign. This minus sign is associated with that term, right? Because it's not in front of the 1. It's, it's not in front of the 1. So it's a positive 1, so we move up one unit. So mm. if we move up to this uh, position right here, mm. right? And if we just drew the same graph again, where this, this is parallel to that, right? Right. So like that. And we did the same thing again. So like that. There it is. And now, this latest graph, and in fact, let's make it solid, right? Right. Because that's what we need. This graph. Okay. 
There it is. And this is the graph of y equals 1 minus the absolute value of x minus 6. Now, uh, you did very well, Holman. Now, you notice that we did all of that without actually finding the, the, the points. We didn't even set up a chart, did we? No, we didn't. We didn't have to. We didn't have to. We just used what we knew, translated the graph, move it up. Uh, if we needed to rotate it about some axis or flip it about some axis, we did that, right? Right. And this is your final answer. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Now, Holman, we just have a few more minutes, so I'd like you to help me with a second problem, okay? Okay. All right. Let's take a look at that problem. And this one, Holman, it came from a geometry book, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though it's not really, well, maybe it is a geometry problem, right? Yeah. Can you see the problem? Mm -hmm. Would you read it for us, please, Holman? Find the angle formed by the hands of the clock at 824. At 824. Now, in trying to solve a problem such as that, it makes sense to actually draw that picture, right? Right. And so you see the face of a clock, mm -hmm. and we want to uh, show 824. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. At that time, let, let's have this be the center of the clock, right? Mm -hmm. So 824 is um, uh, just, just before the 25, right? right. Let's call that 8. That's, so this is 24. That's my estimation, OK? OK. All right. Um, and then uh, this hand will be a somewhere there. It, just a little past the 8, right? Yeah, almost halfway. Almost halfway. So that's, that's about good? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is 824. And what we want to do is to find the measure of this angle, right? Right. OK, this angle. All right. Now then. What are we going, how, do, how would we go about this? Do you have any idea? Um, would you connect the two hands together or no? Well, okay, well, instead of doing that, let, let me show you. See, there are 12 divisions, right? You okay. see that? Yeah. And uh, what is the measure of uh, a circle? Oh, you divide 360 by um, 12. And that gives us 30 degrees, right? Yeah, so each, each um, from like 7 to 8 or from 6 to um, 7. It's, it's 30, it's right? 30 degrees. So this is 1, 2, 3. 3, yeah. So that would be 3 times 30 Which degrees. Nice. All right, now, but then we have to account for the 24 minutes. And let's do that by writing 24 out of our 60, out of one hour, right? right. 24, 60, and that would also have to be multiplied by 30 again. Because mm -hmm. again, now what I'm saying is that this hour hand, it mm -hmm. will move that amount of degrees in that time period, right? Mm -hmm. And since it is moving away from the A, let's, let us add. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, and uh, so we have that, all right. And therefore, this is what we have. So what is 3 times 90. 30? 90. That's 90. Um, and then, can we reduce this? Yeah, you, you cancel out the 30, and you reduce the 60. OK, so this is 2. Yeah. And that is? 12. 12. So that's 90 plus 12, right? 102. OK, and what is that? 102. 102. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Holman? Right. Let's have a round of applause for Holman. Now, Holman has been with us for how many years now? Three years? Two and a half. Oh. Two and a half years, OK. And now you're moving on to college, and um, you're stuck with us through quite a few anniversary shows, right? Thank you very much, Holman, and I'll talk to you again uh, later. Now, my time is up, but don't go away, because Homework Outline continues with the 11th anniversary special. Stay tuned.
Hello, I'm Robert Vriesman. And I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews. And welcome to the second half of Homework Hotline. Today is our 11th anniversary show. It's been a long time. Yes, it has. And we're taking that opportunity to share with you some clips and highlights from the past years of Homework Hotline. I'm not so sure I want to see this. <laughs> now, normally on the show, we start the second half of Homework Hotline without any titles. But today, by popular demand, we're altering our usual format. And we present a tape that answers the question, what do the teachers do while the opening titles are playing on the air? Roll the tape. Later on in the English segment, the tape I know you're all waiting for, are bloopers. Now let's get back to Homer Hotline with Robert and more Matt. You know, it just occurred to me, we're not paid nearly enough for this show, you know that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I just can't talk now. What I have to do in this little short segment, I'm just going to take a few minutes because I'm going to introduce Mario in just a minute, is I want to characterize a thousand for you, all right? A lot of times we throw these numbers around and we don't have a clear idea of the quantity or, or, or the volume or, or the magnitude that we're talking about. So let's take a look first of all at this cube. To the best of my ability, I drew a cube up here. Now this is actually 10 inches. I couldn't get that aspect 10 inches because I only had a two-dimensional surface with which to uh, demonstrate a three-dimensional object. But if we have something that's 10 inches by 10 inches, we know that this base right here, this base, is going to be 100 square inches. And then when we multiply that 100 square inches by another height of 10, it gives us a volume of 1,000 inches cubed. All right? So this would, this would represent what a 1,000 inch, inches cubed would, would look like. All right? Now, let's move over here. To give us another idea of what a 1,000 would be, if we had a 1,000 pennies, well, that's only $10. Every time we pick up a $10 bill, that represents a 1,000 pennies. Or, in order to go a thousand yards, we'd have to run back and forth on a football field ten times. Or, that those little exponents that, that strike fear into the hearts of millions of junior high school students, it only means ten times ten times ten, or a thousand. And over the course of junior high and high school, we hope that the students happily do thousands of math problems. Now, that's not a specific amount, but that gives us an idea of a large quantity. And now I'd like to introduce Mario. Mario, you want to walk right on? I thought I'd dance on. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robert. Certainly. Do I have that call ready? Is that, is that Herman? Yes. Great, Herman. And you were asking me about these words. Democracy? Is that right? Yes. Okay. And you were asking me about oligarchy. Oh, I love that word. Oligarchy. You also asked, asked me about monarchy, right? I have that right. Yeah. And then you threw in dictatorship. Okay, dictatorship. I'm going to just go right over that math business. And then finally, theocracy. Theocracy. Let's see if we can explain these a little bit. First of all, democracy is a comes from the Greek and it means the people govern. It's, it's, a, it's a government by the people. Oligarchy is a government, the word here, right here, means small. So in an oligarchy we have a small number of people who govern. In a monarchy, right in here we have the word one. So there's one person who's, rule, who's ruling in that, in that kind of government. And then in a dictatorship, we also have one person as a rule. And then theocracy, we have government by God. Now let's see if we can explain these, because you asked me some questions. 
And the first one had to do with uh, who holds the power. If I told you that this is a government by the people, who holds the power in that kind of a government, Herman? Um, us. Okay, us, we the people. You like that phrase? Yeah. Okay, we the people. Now, can you give me an example of a, of a, of a country that has, de, that has a democracy where the people rule? Uh, us? Okay, us, U.S., great. The United States. And there are lots of other countries. More and more countries are becoming democracies. How about the oligarchy now? Oligarchy, remember, that's a rule by a small person. Right. I, I, I shouldn't say a small. We're not talking, of, okay. It's not by a small person, but by a small number of persons, okay? Yeah. Okay. And a good example of that is over here. I don't know if the camera can follow, but there used to be a country here called Burma. I don't know if you can make it out. It's over here. It's now called Myanmar. Oh, what a word. Let me see if I can get that down here someplace. Myanmar, right there. Can we see that? Myanmar, that used to be Burma. And it's ruled by a small number of people who control the government and the country. Then we have a monarchy. And a monarchy, that means a king or a queen rules the country. And a good example there, let's see if I can show you again, a good example would be Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. We have a king there called King Fahd. King Fahd. He rules there. So that's the monarchy. Now a dictatorship, that means that one person dictates everything. When someone dictates, he's telling you what to do, okay? Like the boss? Uh, oh, that's a good one. Uh, uh, a dictator would be the big boss. We're not talking about Springsteen now, but we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about somebody who controls a country. And can you name a dictatorship where one person rules, a strong man? Uh, me, my room. <laughs> All right. Look at this. There's a country here called Cuba. Does that ring a bell? Uh, Cuba. No. Okay, it doesn't. All right, Cuba. And the ruler there is a dictator called, oh, this map is always getting in the way. That ruler is called Fidel Castro. And he's the dictator there, okay? So that's an example of, of the dictatorship. A theocracy now, that means God rules. The country is ruled by God. And what happens there is that you have a religious person or a group of religious persons who run the country because they say that they have divine authority. And an example there, I'm, I'm gonna wind up with a kind of map elbow here, but all right. A good example there, if I can steady the world, would be Iran, this country right here, formerly called Persia. And right there, we have a religious group ruling it. Uh, a few years ago, it was the Ayatollah Khomeini, and now you have someone else in his stead. But it's ruled by a religious group. So that would be an example of a theocracy. In our own country, a long time ago, before we became a country, there was the, there was the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that was ruled by the Puritans. And that would have been an example of a theocracy, a religious group that rules it, ruled it in the name of God. Okay, now let's see what other questions you have. You wanted to know about a written constitution. As a rule, the, only, the best example of a written constitution would be our country, our democracy. Our United States Constitution has become a model for countries throughout the world. And, and it's a model because it seems to work. We don't have revolutions. We don't have uprisings of, uh, that, that you have in other countries. We like to settle things legally through free elections with everybody having a chance to vote. So that would be a people's democracy. Now, let's see. Uh, how much time do we have now? Five minutes. All right, good. Now, we, we can get into your other question. As far as the top positions now, let's see if we can nail this down. 
in a democracy, who is the, the head of our country? Who has been elected the head of our country? The president. Bill the Clinton. president. And can you name him? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. So he, that top position is held by the president. But in our country, the thing that makes it work is that we don't put power in the hands of one person or one group of people. We divide it in three parts. We have the president, that's one part. And then we have Congress. Congress is the second part. And then the third part would be the Supreme Court. Those are the three parts that make our country work. Now the president is the head, but Congress is the one, they're the ones that pass the laws. They're the ones that, that get the laws passed. And the president can, can sign something into law or he can veto it and then Congress ha has to pass it with a, with a greater number of votes. The Supreme Court judges the law whether those laws made by Congress conform to the United States Constitution. Like so we, Proposition 87? Say that again? Like Proposition 187? Oh, Herman, you're way ahead of me. We passed Proposition 187 in California. Is that right? Right. Okay. Now, now that's going to go through the courts, and eventually it's going to come up here to the Supreme Court, and they're going to vote on whether that proposition that we passed here, whether that proposition conforms to the United States Constitution. Okay? So that's a good example of, of what we're talking about, how a democracy, especially ours, operates with those three powers. Okay, Herman, let's see what else we have here. Uh, how about, do we have fair elections in this country? Yes. We try to. There are some times when uh, uh, people, uh, people are voting while, while they're still in cemeteries, <laughs> but by and large, we try to have free elections. How about in a monarchy? Are there any elections there uh, where the king no. rules? No, no, the king takes care of it, or he may, uh, he may have something he calls an, an election, but he usually rigs it. In a dictatorship, they have elections all the time, but there's only one way to vote, okay? So there and, is? What's that? So there is? Yeah, a dictatorship will, will have elections. For instance, if we go back to Fidel Castro, uh, he promised that when he took power, he was going to have elections within 90 days. Well, that 90 days has stretched into a, a long time. And then, of course, we have other types of elections in dictatorships where someone will have the, the election, and on the ballot, instead of having a yes or a no, the people come and they, they only have one choice. They either vote the yes, agreeing with, with the dictator, and there's no no. So that's one way that they get around it. Herman, my time is up, but please call again, okay? All right. Okay. Now, do I have Camille on the line? Yes. Camille, you were interested in Proverbs, and you wanted to know about this one. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Yes. Okay. That's the one, right? Yes. Okay. A rolling stone. And I won't say the obvious about Mick Jagger here, but okay, a rolling stone. What this, what this means is that if, so, when, if this is a stone and there's moss that gathers on it, you, I think it's on the north side, I'm not sure. But if it gathers, that means that, that something is able to grow, some, some, some growth is, is able to, to be created on the stone while it's not moving. So the thing that we're talking about here is motion. Uh -huh. Motion. If something is in motion, if something is active, there is no chance for that moss to grow. There's no chance for anything, or for grass to grow on it or weeds because it's in motion. And so the idea is that when someone tells you a rolling stone gathers no moss, they're telling you Get up and get, and get active. Get away from that TV or the moss is going to grow right up that sofa. Uh -huh. You got it, Camille? Yeah. Okay, now look out for that moss. My time is up. And here's Deborah.
Thank you, Mario. As regular viewers of Homework Hotline know, we rarely make mistakes on the air. The operative word here is rarely, and we do make mistakes. Most of, the, most of the time, it's something simple, like forgetting our phone number. You know it, 1-800-LA, oh yes, LA study. But what Homework Hotline anniversary show would be, com but Homework Hotline anniversary show would be complete without our blooper reel. Let's look at the tape, which includes many scenes from our original set. Our Emmy, Emmy, excuse me, Emmy, Emmy nominated homework hotline show will be on in just a minute. Our lines are open, so give us a call at 1 800 LA Study. We're all set to help you with our, your English and math homework, and we've got some problems. Our phone number here at the studio is 1 800 LA Study, or uh, you can dial the number simply by dialing 1 800 and the numbers that go with <laughs> L.A. study. Hi, I'm Ellen Stonehill. Homework Hotline will be on in just a minute. Our lines are now open, so phone us with, in with your English and math questions. Call us at 1-800-LA-STUDY. We're all set to help you with math and English. So now let's begin the show. It's time for me to wrap up math, but stay tuned for 30 minutes of English and Steve and Ellen are waiting to teach you something. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> but that's all I have, and I'd like to, uh, to donate the remainder of my time to uh, a fine math teacher, in fact, the teacher of the year for Los Angeles City Schools, Mr. Ira Moscow. Thanks, Ira. Does well, that answer your question? That, that answers, and that's really interesting. I never knew a lot of this stuff. Thank which you. really goes to show you that whether you're a teacher or anybody, there's still plenty of stuff that you can learn. By the way, if you enjoyed watching Hall Davidson, you know, you can watch him on the mornings at, uh, from 7.30 to 8 o'clock on this same channel, channel 58, uh, doing more math. And it's, uh, so if you ever can't go to school someday or you're ill, turn on channel 58, watch Hall, then you'll probably really be ill. You dogs, you dogs, you dogs, dogs, dogs. Remember, you can call between 3.30 and 6 o'clock Monday through Thursday. The number is 1-800-500-88, that's wrong. 1-800-LA-STUDY will be easier. I couldn't see it. We'll see you tomorrow at 4.30, and I'm Ellen Stonehill, and this is Homework Hotline. If you have any questions uh, about anything that you're studying, be, be, sure you can, um, be sure you can study by calling up the LA teachers, the 1-800-LA-STUDY, which is 527-8839-1800, or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. And uh, everything will be made clear by our wonderful teachers here. So, um... <laughs> well, I'm lost here. Uh, characterization, I do, um, help me out here. The, um, bye. <laughs> well, before we get started, let's go to one of our English teachers, Angela Hewlett Block, at the phones, and see what kinds of calls are coming in. Angela. Homework Hotline is coming to you from TV Land and Cable 2. It's the time is right for you to call in, give the answer to the puzzle, and you can win. Call for English help, and you can talk to me. I'll answer your questions from A to Z. English is on at 5, but it's time for math, and Frank is here, and <laughs> we'll give him a bath. All right. And that's right, Angela. Now. Remember, you can call in your questions simply by calling 1-800-527-8839 or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. The call is free, the help is free. So what are you waiting for? And now, here's Frank and Angela. Okay, thank you, Angela. I think Angela wanted to finish what she had to say. I have it right now. Okay, here's Angela. She's gonna finish up what she was saying. Okay. All right, okay. English is on at 5 o'clock, but it's time for math, and Frank is going to rock. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we're going to grab cosine. And the, and the problem on this one, and I see, see my board. <laughs> the problem on this one is... But stay tuned for 15 more minutes of math with Craig. 
Thank you so much, Doris. And I, too, have a caller on the line. Hello? If you'd like to make a call... Oh, please. dear Jesus. Well, that's interesting. Maybe uh, my caller is the operator. Isn't she a wonderful lady? No. Uh, is my caller there? Possibly not. She's off? She's gone. Well, we'll come back to her. I'll... No, uh, the radius yeah. of the circle. The radius. Yeah, the radius of the circle. Yeah. I want the stage manager to come right on here so I can see. I'm going to give you a big hint, okay? Okay. Okay, here's a big hint. The radius of the circle? Three. Three, right, right. Okay, thank you very much. You did a good job, okay? That just happens to be how much time I have left, three minutes, but it just worked out that the radius of the circle is three, okay? Okay. All right, now. Yes, and again, I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews, and I like to start my segment of uh, the English portion of the segment. And um, I'd like to start with something that I uh, ended with last week. I ran out of time last week and I wasn't able to clarify myself with regard to these rules and I'd like to go through that right now. I received a call about subject and verb agreement and that call came from Sarah and she was from Southgate Junior High School. And I just want to go over the rules very quickly. First of all, when you are uh, combining subjects or when we're talking about subject and verb agreement, when we have a subject that's combined with the, the conjunction and, the rule says that when you have a compound subject combined with and, the verb is always plural. So in this particular case, the sentence reads March and April, the verb would be plural in this case and it would be are. March and April are windy months. So again, when you have a compound subject and that compound subject is joined by and, we uh, always select a plural verb. Going on to the second example, the second rule that I, I was saying last week is that when you have a compound verb and uh, you have that uh, compound subject and the compound subject is joined by uh, or, that subject always is singular. Okay, so it's the opposite of the first uh, rule that I gave you. So in this case, we have either tea or coffee is fine with me. So is would be the correct answer. So when we have the compound subject joined by and, we use a plural verb. When we have the compound subject joined by are, we use a, a singular verb. And then letter C is uh, what I ended with last week, and we said either Joan or her friends. The sentence says is, is or are mistaken. Now the rule says when we have a compound subject, it's joined by are, but notice that one of the subjects, this subject here is singular but the combined subject here is plural. So when we have them mixed in this way where we have part of the compound subject being singular and the other part is plural, what I was saying last week is that the verb <coughs> agrees with the, the part of the subject that's closest to it. Okay, so since friends is closest to the verb here uh, and friends is plural, we know that we're going to need a plural verb and we know that R is plural here. So the sentence would read, either Joan or her friends are mistaken. Okay, so we're looking at the, the part of the compound subject that, that's closest to the verb. Okay, now the opposite is true here for letter D. Letter D, either the squirrels or the dog. And notice we have um, digs are dig a new hole in the yard at least once a day. Now again, in this case, we have uh, squirrels being plural this time, and then we have dog here being singular. And notice that dog is closest to, to the verb, so what we want to do is we want to select <coughs> a singular verb. Now we know that singular verbs have S's on the end in this form, so we know that the correct answer would be digs. Either the squirrels or the dog digs a new hole in the yard at least once a day. So I, I just wanted to take a moment to clarify that that I, I wasn't able to explain last week. Now if you could just come back over here to, the, uh, to this portion of the board, I wanted to share a poem and this poem is written, it's a very short poem and it's written by Al Young and it's entitled Four Poets and he's given a very short and simple message to poets and um, in the poem he uses a lot of imagery and I hope I get to this poem but anyway um, Imagery, we know imagery is defined as the words and phrases that create vivid sensory experiences for the reader. So in other words, the, the poet chooses words that uh, allow us as readers to visualize or to use our senses to experience the poem. Now the poem is very short. I'd like to just read it very quickly, if I may. Okay. 
Um, and again, I said it's written by Al Young, and he's giving a message, a message to poets, and he's uh, entitled it for poets. Notice in stanza one, he says, stay beautiful, but don't stay down underground too long. Don't turn into a mole or a worm or a root or a stone. And notice in that stanza, he starts off very positively about, about poets, and he's saying, don't stay underground too long. Okay, and notice that the, the imagery that he uses, he uses words like mole, worm, root, stone. And he's saying, um, don't be so caught up in, in writing that you don't get out to experience nature. Um, and this is, nature is very important in this poem. But going on, come on out into the sunlight, breathe in trees, knock out mountains, commune with snakes and be the very hero of birds. Don't forget to poke your head up and blink, think, walk all around, swim upstream, don't forget to fly. Okay, and, and basically what he's saying is that don't get so caught up into uh, don't get caught up into writing so that you isolate yourself and not experience the beautiful, the beautiful things that are out in nature. There's so many things to experience and in essence he's saying that this will help your, uh, the writing of the poet. So he's admonishing poets to, to do just that. And that's something that we can take into consideration too as beginning writers and writers of poetry. When we go out in nature, we can find things to write about, and we can experience nature in, in that form. Okay, so again, this is a poem. It's written by Al Young, and he's a, a famous musician as well as a, a famous writer as well. And he's currently living here in, in California. Well, that's the end of my segment. I'd like to thank everyone for join, joining us in our celebration of, our, of, of 11 years of Homer Cotline. So I'd like to just walk over and join the other teachers at our annual cake and celebration table. Thank you. <laughs> the cake was generously provided by Queen's Bakery. Queen's Bakery has two locations to serve you. In Chinatown, call 213-622-9749. And in San Gabriel, call 818-281-8886.